Uh, we are in a sermon series called uh, Diving Deep. Uh, we've been doing it all through uh, this month, and today we're going to kind of wrap it up and talk a little more about some things. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to invite you and encourage you to invite your friends. In November, we're going to be talking about the power of thanksgiving. Uh, I was taught to say thank you as, um, as, as a part of being polite. Uh, and fear that I would get in trouble if I didn't. Um, but really, Thanksgiving, although it's a secular holiday, really is a, is a Christian idea, a Judeo-Christian idea. And it, it's really important to your spiritual life. It just, it just really is. And so because there's a secular holiday called Thanksgiving, we often take one day and we talk about that. And I just decided that wasn't enough. And so we're just going to take the whole month of November and talk about Thanksgiving uh, in our spiritual lives. Uh, and we're going to have some fun with, uh, with some of you who've uh, been a part of making some of the bumpers uh, where people are telling people what they're thankful for. So I would encourage you to come. I think it will be an encouraging and uplifting time uh, in your life and in the life of our church as well. So as we're talking about diving deep, I, I, this sermon today is one that I worked and reworked and reworked and reworked because uh, we're going to talk about something that's kind of complicated. Uh, and, and somehow I decided I probably wasn't good to preach for two hours. I needed to get it down a little bit. Uh, and so um, I'm going to kind of move through a, a fair amount of scripture here. Uh, if you have your Bibles, that would be really great. Uh, you may have to jump around a little bit or your phones with a Bible or the, our church app has one. But I do kind of want to begin with a question, uh, and that is this. Uh, what does freedom mean? Just shout it out. Okay, for Americans, that's not good. <laughs> We're kind of into the freedom thing, okay? What does freedom mean? Freedom, condemnation. Yep, what was the one down here? Speech, freedom of speech. Uh, from oppression. Is that what you said? Self-expression, yes. Second Amendment. Independence. Freedom to worship. Okay, now let's, we've started this, but here's that, that's kind of the bigger political kind of question, which is important. We should all give thanks every day that we live in a free country. If you've ever been to one that's not, we are blessed uh, to do that. But here's, let's narrow it. What does spiritual freedom mean? Free to worship God. That, that's kind of still political, but yeah. Without an inter intermediary. In, okay, yeah, what he said. Without that. Person in between. Yeah. No bondage. Ooh, that's good. No condemnation. Peace. You guys should preach this sermon. You really kind of got it. You're going on right all there. So, so um, when we think about the freedom, uh, spiritual freedom, what are we free from? How about that? You didn't know I was going to quiz you this morning, did you? <laughs> condemnation. Guilt. Consequences. Death. Ooh, yeah. What was the other one? Tyranny, yes, thank you. I'm getting older, so you got to speak up in all of this. So, so when we, we think about that, we're going to talk about this idea of spiritual freedom, because that's kind of the last piece in the going deeper thing. Um, and and I, I really, really want you to get this, because it's so important to your spiritual uh, life. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 8, uh, and we're going to kind of start with the end, and then we're going to kind of work our way back to it. And just a, a reminder to you, um, the book of John and, and all of the Johannian, Johannian lit was actually written late. Uh, so when Paul is writing, he's writing pretty early in the life of the first century Christians, and they're kind of working on things, and so he does some very kind of philosophical sort of things. But by John, they've had a little more time to think about it, and so uh, they really kind of get at it in some good ways, and John often takes really complicated things and says them really well. And so we'll start with John, and then we're going to back up into Paul uh, a little bit. But John chapter 8, it says this, Jesus replied, very truly, I uh, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. That's the bad news, <laughs> you know. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let's say that last line together. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And there's a really important thing going on here about slavery and, and language and freedom uh, with all of this. And John is really trying to kind of change the concept in a way that Jesus did. Uh, but, but let's kind of just sum that up. And it says this, Christ has given his followers freedom from the grip of sin and for the embrace of God. Okay. Americans kind of get this. Freedom isn't just freedom from stuff, it's freedom for stuff. 
You know, we have the freedom from stuff so that we can become other stuff, so that we can be things. And there's no place where that's more important than in the spiritual realm. We have been freed from the grip of sin so that we can embrace the love of God, so that we can become what God would have us to be. Sin is like a disease. It's, it's like a cancer. It, it destroys us and it tears us apart. Uh, and, and so he has set us free from sin in order that we might get the embrace of God. And the truth of the matter is, this would have been kind of a hard concept for them a little bit. Because before Christ came, relationship with God was defined and controlled by law. You remember the Old Testament? Uh, the, the Ten Commandments, it kind of started with that. You could count them on your fingers. There was just ten of them. Uh, but by the time of Jesus, there were hundreds of them that you had to keep. And you, it's hard to even know what they all were. And, and, uh, and so life became all about keeping all of the rules, you know. And, and the way you were spiritual was you don't break the rules, Okay. And, and, and when you broke the rules, then you weren't spiritual. And when you kept the rules, you, you were spiritual. But, but your whole spiritual life was about not breaking the law uh, as much as you possibly can. And, and everybody, of course, broke the law because there's way too many rules and all of that. And then when you did that, you had to do something about that. You had to go and make a sacrifice. Or, or maybe it was a part that was covered in the yearly kind of sacrifices for the whole of Israel. And then if you did really bad stuff, then, then you more consequences all the way up and to, you know, stoning and all kinds of things like that. And so um, what, what was happening was they were, they were kind of getting caught in, in, in all of this. Um, they, there was a cycle that they were caught in about, you know, keep the rules. Oop, I made a mistake. Pay the price. Or try to keep the rules better. Oop, I made a mistake. Pay the price. Oop, I made a big mistake. Don't tell anybody about that one. And it, it kind of became this cycle of what is described as slavery. So let me get this. So if you're following along in the notes, in the Old Testament, right relationship with God or righteousness was about keeping track of all of your sins and making sacrifices to atone. That was the definition of spirituality. Keep track of all your sins and make sacrifices. Because unlike the, the, the cops, you can't get away from God. <laughs> you know? I, I know that none of you have never, never, ever gone over the speed limit, whether there was a cop there or not. And the cop in our church, is he outside? So um, I once in a while have gone a little over the speed limit, you know, and I didn't get caught. I didn't get the tickets. Like, woohoo! Don't look at me. You feel the same way, you know? I'll look at me like, we'd never do that, you know? And, but, but with God, you're always going to get caught, right? Because God sees everything. So you're kind of in this pickle with this system that's been set up where, it, it, you know, you, we're, we struggle with all of that. that there's the sacrifices we have to make. And, and the reality is this, especially in our lifetime, the devil beats us up about that. You know, oh, you screwed up. Oh, you made another mistake. When are you ever going to get this right, you know? And he beats us up, and he beats us up, and he beats us up uh, about all of that. And, and it just really kind of became a yoke of sin that was really hard for them. And if you grew up in a legalistic environment, you know what I mean. It, it's hard for us, too. I grew up in a hyper-legalistic environment, and I was afraid that if I went to a movie, I was going to go to hell, you know? And that's, you know, I've gone past that, but, but that's, that was like them. And so we need to have a little bit of a conversation about sin before we kind of jump into this, because we want to be free from sin, the grip of sin. Amen? Okay. So uh, sin, Old and New Testament. In the, the Old Testament, uh, sometimes called the Old Covenant, it was about law. We've talked about that. So we have the Old Covenant law. The New Covenant is grace. Yeah, you all get that. That's the word we use all the time. Um, uh, and, and so we, we talk a lot about grace, 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 this, that sort of thing and all of that. Can I let you in on a little secret, a little Bible secret? Here's a, you know, a, a theology geek kind of thing. Don't, don't tell anybody this, okay? Because it upsets people sometimes, but Jesus never talked about grace. Come as a surprise? He, he, didn't, he didn't. He didn't talk about grace. Paul talked about grace a lot. And the, the reason for that was Paul was often writing letters to places where Gentiles and Jews were trying to do church together. He was writing to the, the Gentile churches in Rome or Ephesus or Colossae or, you know, all of these kind of places around. And what was happening in all of those places, especially in Rome, which we're going to look at the book of Romans in just a minute, was that all kinds of diverse people were coming together. And the Jews were really frustrated because when people became followers of Jesus, they didn't follow all the law. Because their understanding of the way you're spiritual is you keep the rules, right? And so now we've got all these people in church that aren't keeping the rules. And that's not fair because they're having more fun than me, you know. 
So they, they struggle with that. And, and so Paul is trying to help these Jews come forward and understand that, that the new followers don't have to keep all the rules, that that's not the way it works. There's a new system uh, that's being a, a part of this. And so he, he has this idea of grace. And grace is a law word, right? Because what is grace? Unmerited favor. But basically it means you broke the rules and someone gave you grace or mercy and you don't experience the consequences of the rule, right? It, it, by definition, if you don't have law, you don't have grace. You have to have law to have grace. There's whole conversations in the Bible about all of that, that sort of thing. But lo- grace is a law word. Uh, and grace is really the closest law word that Paul could get to help the Jews understand what God was doing. But actually, Jesus did something much bigger than that. Much bigger than you're just going to get grace and you're going to get out of the consequences of all your mistakes, but you're still caught in this constant thing of, oh, I made a mistake. Oh, I broke the law. Oh, I did this sort of thing. So here's what actually happened. Um, Jesus radically changed the way uh, we relate to God. He, He just completely changed the whole process in all of that. So the Old Testament is primarily about perceived, God is primarily perceived as a judge. When you think of the word judge, what do you think of? Fines. Final. Final, yeah. Punishment. Consequences. What? Verdict. Yeah, you do not think warm and fuzzy when you think judge, do you? Nobody thinks warm and fuzzy. We all think if you're in front of a judge, something's gone wrong. It's just not where you want to be in all of that. And that's kind of the way Israel perceived that. Break the law, face the punishment. If you're lucky, you might get grace or mercy. But in the New Covenant, Jesus changed the way they talked about God. In fact, in the Old Covenant, God was primarily perceived as judge. In the New Covenant, God becomes our Heavenly Father. That is a huge change. Now, if you had a good father, what do you think of when you think of father? Love. Protector. Acceptance counselor, teacher, hope. Those those are all the things that so much different from judge. You see where it's going with this, where Jesus said, you know, the judge thing, I get that, the black and white, that's, that's not, I'm not against the law, but there's so much more you can experience of God. And so there's this wonderful thing where Jesus is making this move from understanding how we relate to God as, as keeping the law to a heavenly father. And so, if God is our Father, then our relationship to Him is about love, not law. This is the important one. If God is our Father, our relationship to Him is about love, not law. Say, love, not law. Yes. We give grace to people because of love. How many of you have ever given grace to your children when they didn't deserve it? Yeah. Yeah, how many of you as a child got grace when you didn't deserve it? Everybody raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand, you know, because we, because we all do. That's the nature of grace. It isn't that you deserve it. It is that someone loves you enough to, to give it to you. Uh, and so love is kind of the reason for grace. And Jesus never talked about grace, not because he didn't believe in grace, but because he wanted to talk about the deeper thing that creates grace. And that is the fact that we are loved by God. God is our father. We are his children. There's all this family love that we tell you all the time. Family is the primary delivery system of God's love. And that's not just the biological family. That's we are family. This is why when you go out of here, I say go and love each other. Because we're family and we deliver love to one another. And and he's trying to change this from the idea of God as judge to God as heavenly father. Now, that doesn't get rid of the law. My kids are all gone, but when my kids were little, I was judge, jury, and executioner in their world. You know, just ask them. They'll tell you all about it, you know. And, And here's what you need to know about this difference, and that it's this. You are God's child, and he loves you more than you love your children. I just know of no better way to express God's love, because if you have children, you, you'd do anything for them. You'd do, I would lay down my life for my children. And God loves me more than I love my children. That's hard for me to get my head around. God loves you more than you love your children. That changes then how we relate to the law, how we relate to the world in in all of this. God loves you so much that that, that you can't even understand it. And, And get this, God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. 
You know? I don't want God to love me. Tough. God loves you anyway, you know? How many of you remember when your children child said to you for the first time, I hate you? <laughs> Did it change the fact that you loved them? No. No, they were too young to understand all of that, you know? And, and the truth of the matter is, he offers you his love. He offers you invitation into his family. And all we have to do is accept it. Just like you would accept your child back if they were lost to get them back. In fact, there's a wonderful image in scripture of Jesus who stands at the door and knock. It comes from Revelation chapter uh, 3, verse 20. And it's this idea that, that if you don't know Christ, he's at the door going, can I come in? Can, can, can I come in? I, I have something good for you. I know you're under law. I know you're, you're struggling with all this stuff. You've got this stuff in your past that tears you apart. And can I come in and make a difference in your life? Can I come in and, and change you and all of that? And the reality is if you will let him in, he will make his home with you. You become family with Jesus, family with God. He'll clean up your past and everybody's got a past. He will forgive you of that stuff and he will help you become what he's designed you to be. It'll revolutionize your marriage. It'll revolutionize your relationship to your kids. It'll revolutionize your relationship to your extended family. It'll revolutionize your relationships with others because you will become changed. The old has become something new. And I want you to know that that invitation is here this morning. And I know for some of you, you grew up in dysfunctional homes. And so this idea of God as family and God as father is, is hard for you. But, but the truth of the matter is, in a great family, it's the most wonderful thing there is. And some of you who grew up with dysfunctional families, you're all about creating a good and healthy family in your generation. Amen? Break the cycle, man. Break the cycle. Build a godly family. And, and when you discover that godly family, it changes the way you relate to the house rules. My, my dad was kind of a strict dad. He's kind of old-fashioned about some of that sort of thing. Anyone want to say amen? Anybody else have an old-fashioned dad in there, you know? That whole not spanking thing, oh, that wasn't a part of my family, you know? <laughs> you know I wish it had been, you know? But, but, but when you relate to law as an outside sort of thing, it's all about fear, isn't it, you know? You go before the judge, fear. You know, the lights come on behind you, fear, how much is this going to cost me? You know, plus the insurance costs, plus fear, fear, fear. But in the context of family, the, the law, the guidance of God isn't about fear. It's, a, it's about relationship with our Heavenly Father. And in a healthy family, there is no fear. In fact, let me just say, in healthy families, there is no fear. And if you grew up in a healthy family, you understand this. I was not afraid of my dad, even though he was strict. He never hit me any place except where I sit down, you know. His hands were, were, were hands that could, in fact, spank me, but I was never afraid when he would touch me because there was no fear in my relationship with my dad. I was never afraid of anything he would do. And, and, and for you, that, that, that's hard. I just want you to know, be the father that your father was supposed to be. Be the, the, the loving father that you were supposed to be. And because because it also changes when you get caught. With the law, when you get caught, you just pay the price. But here's in my family. I knew that if I confessed, my earthly father would always help me deal with my failure. Every time. We, we kind of had one really big rule in our family, and we have it in our family, Jody and I, and that is don't lie. Because if you lie, it kind of messes the whole system up, Right? I knew that if I would tell my dad when I screwed up, that he would say, well, son, let's, let's figure out how to fix this. Let's, let's figure out what we can do. He would join me in kind of reconciliation in that. And sometimes there were punishments in all of that. But, but it was always about making me into who Christ had intended me to be in, in all of that. And, and when it was really, really bad, there were a couple, three times it was really bad, he didn't even give me a lecture. I wish he'd given me a lecture. I'd have felt better if he'd given me a lecture. Spanking would have been even better, but by then I was a little too big. He'd just look at me, and he'd look over his glasses like this at me, right? And it'd just, it'd just kill me because I realized I had disappointed my father. And here, Here's a picture of him. Uh, his name's Owen. Uh, and and um, Sorry, I didn't realize this was going to affect me. He's in heaven now. But that approach, the approach of love between a father and a child radically changes how we do obedience in the world. If it's law, it's adversarial. No cops around, I can go 10 miles over rather than five miles over. 
But if it's a relationship, it changes because it's not about whether or not I can break the law. It's about my relationship with my heavenly Father. And I knew that the relationship was what mattered, not law. Let me say it like this. Relationship, not law. I'd been given the gift of a loving father. And when I got to high school and I had an opportunity to do some things that would have gotten me in a lot of trouble, I ended up being the kid that didn't do them. I ended up being the good kid. And I wasn't the good kid because I was afraid of the consequences. Because I'm pretty smart and hard to catch. I didn't do them because I knew that if my dad ever found out, it would disappoint him. And honestly... As strong as peer pressure is in high school, this is the power of a loving father relation, parent, parent relationship. I chose to disappoint my friends rather than my father. And that's what Jesus was saying. You are his children. He loves you more than you love your children. He, he is for you. He, he is the one that, 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 that can take care of this situation. Why are you worried about all of this stuff? Why are you doing all this navel gazing? You know what navel gazing is? Oh, you guys didn't grow up in nearly legal enough homes, man. I grew up. Navel gazing is when you're kind of looking for all the little tiny sins that you may have done wrong because God is going to get you if you cross one of those lines. And so Paul is talking to those kind of people and he's trying to get this idea of God as Father into their world and, and the Jews can't get that because that's actually sacrilege for them. So in, in Romans chapter uh, 6, he, he kind of makes a move here that's really important. Um, and there's a couple things you need to know. Just I'm going to just give these to you. Number one, uh, Jesus destroyed the power of sin at the resurrection. He's already talked about this sort of stuff. So sin does not have power over you. Uh, when we fell, it was kind of a cosmic thing. God, uh, in the resurrection, when he died, he forgave us of our sins. When he was risen, he broke the power of sin. Somebody say amen. He broke the power of sin. That's good news. It doesn't have to it doesn't have dominion over you. And then the second thing in this passage, he is talking about sin is missing the mark. We've talked about this. There are all kinds of, there are 28 words in Greek and Hebrew that, that can be translated sin, uh, running all the way from rebellion against God, which is the bad one, right? All the way to missing the mark, which means you're trying to do the thing. It's an archer's term, trying to hit the arrow. Any of you ever shot an arrow and missed the mark? Yeah, I'd probably get fewer hands if I said any of you ever shot an arrow and actually hit where you meant to hit, the little thing. That we, we don't, and that's kind of the word that's used here. It's harmatia in, in all of this. And so, not talking about sin as rebellion, but sin of trying to do the right thing and you miss the mark. And so, verse, verse 11 says here, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. And the word for count here is actually, you have been declared this. It's like the judges said, you're okay, you're, you're, you're innocent, you're not guilty, is maybe the better word in all of that. It's not that you're going to do a jailbreak and they're going to come looking for you. you say, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, because of that, do not let sin reign or have rule over you in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Hold on to the mortal body just for a minute because he's drawn an interesting picture. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, okay? So the idea here is that we all have certain things uh, in, in our lives that, that are a struggle for us. And the word for present is actually, the literal Greek word means to come next to, to be in close close proximity to, right? So don't get too close to those things in your life that, that you have that you know is your weakness. Everybody has weaknesses. So if I could put it in modern language, I'd say like this. Give your kryptonite a wide berth, okay? And we all have spiritual kryptonite. No amens there. Let me try this again. We all have spiritual kryptonite. Yes, we do. You know what yours is. I know what mine is. Mine isn't the same as yours, but we all have it. And he says, give it a wide berth. Don't, don't come next to, don't present, go, don't come next to uh, your, your idea here, okay? Uh, and then he goes on to say, but instead, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. That's important to Jews, that idea. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under, say the word, grace. This wonderful word in all. You're not under law, you're under grace. And so he talks about death and life here. So for Jews, dead bodies were considered unclean. And so kind of the image he draws here is don't go poking the dead body of your past sins. Don't be hanging out with the dead bodies. Get away from that sort of thing. Get away from your kryptonite and get close to God. Get closer to him in, in, in all you do. Uh, and, and so the reason for that is because you are free. But it's not enough to just have been declared free. You have to live free. 
Amen? You, gotta, you know, if you're in a jail cell and they open the door and you just stay in the jail cell, the open door don't help you much. You got to get out and live free. Free. My uh, daughter um, is born on June 19th. Uh, and that is a holiday called Juneteenth. Anybody know what Juneteenth is? Yeah, unless you're in the African-American world, you probably don't. Uh, Abraham Lincoln declared the, the, the slaves free. And it took a while for that to get across there. And on June 19th, it finally got to Texas where there were a lot of slaves. And they were free. And they ran off and they did all those things. And they did. But between the time where, where Abraham Lincoln declared them free and June 19th, they lived as slaves even though they had already been declared free. They were legally free, but they kept living like slaves. And, and that's what this is talking about. Sin has no dominion over you. You are not slaves to sin. Why are you still hanging out with sin? Why, why are you still on the plantation of sin? God has so much more for you. He has grace when you mess up. He says, it's okay, let's learn, let's get better. That's what good fathers do. In fact, sometimes it's almost humorous when you watch them mess up, you go, oh, okay, let me help you with that, son, and all of that. You know, because they do what you did. In fact, here's the relationship between grace and love. Grace is what love does. You give grace to your children because you love them. You give grace to others. And the more love there is, the more grace there is in the world because grace is what love does. We, we say it's okay in all of that. You and your children, you, you, you give them grace in all they do. If your, your three-year-old reaches across the table and knocks the milk over for the 400th time, you do not kick them out of the house. Okay? And if you do, Child Protective Services will come looking for you. You give them grace. Why? Because you like cleaning up milk? No. Because you love them. Grace is what love does. Say, grace is what love does. And God loves you more than you love your children. Let that sink in. Grace is what love does. God loves you more than you love your children. So he goes on. Now, now we're going to jump to Romans chapter 8. There's so much good stuff, but we don't have time for all of that. And then, by the way, if you ever start reading in Romans and you read Romans 6, keep going until you hit Romans 8 because if you don't, it'll be really depressing. So Romans 8 starts out like this. This is the good news. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life, and that word is eternal life, has set you free. No, no, not good enough. Has set you free from the law of sin and death. And that's what Paul was getting at, was there used to be this law that bound you, and now there is grace. Now there is the Spirit of the living God in all of this. Jesus set you free uh, to love and to serve God, failures and struggles included. And we are in a time where we move from law to the Holy Spirit, to relationship, to this new kind of way of relating to God. And because of that, we get grace. And we are family. Your family with God. Your family with God. I mean, you, that, that's pretty good genes, man. That's a pretty good lineage in all of that. And he gives you grace because he loves you. Because families love warts and all. Amen? I mean, I, I tell people all the time, they ask me, do you believe in, in uh, love at first sight? No, I don't. It's not possible. Because you can't love somebody till you know what their faults are and love them anyway. I believe in infatuation at first sight. Man, when I first saw the green eyes on my wife, woo 33, 30, yeah, a lot of years later, we love each other because I'm telling you, she knows my faults and she loves me anyway, you know? If you want to nominate her for sainthood, there'll be, you know, things out in the carpet later there. So we love one another, warts and all, and God loves you. And so when you mess up, it's not about keeping track. It's like, oh, I, I made that thing again, and now I, and God's going to get me. And the devil comes along and whispers, you keep falling into that thing over and over again. You have gone too far. And if you're dealing with law, you have gone too far. But if you're dealing with God as Father, you can never go too far. You're not that good, quite frankly, and you can't live that long to go too far for God because you are family. So I urge you, reject the devil's condemnation and embrace your freedom. Never let the devil say again to you, 
you've screwed up again. Embrace the freedom. You just say, I'm God's family. Go away, because you're not. Embrace God's freedom. We're going to sing a great song about this if our musicians would come called Not Another Day. And, and I, I, I want to put a little finer point. We've kind of talked about the ideas. I know for some of you, this is not a big deal. You've been embracing God's freedom for a long time. But for some of you, you live under a constant sense of guilt that you can never measure up to what God has done in your life. You know your failures. You know your flaws. Maybe you had a parent that was like that. And I want you in these moments, we're not going to take an offering right now. I just want you to have a conversation with God as we sing and you listen to the words. And we just step out of the prison. The door's open. You've been declared righteousness. Embrace your freedom. When you make mistakes, you go and you say, I'm sorry. I mean, we more than anybody else should be people that can say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I didn't mean to do that. But embrace your freedom in Christ because you are free and you're a child of the living God.